In addition to the fact that a record sum for war has been allocated in Russia's budget for next year, total censorship is developing there, the leaders of the Russian opposition are being eliminated, human rights activists, independent journalists and public figures are being persecuted, and criticism of the government is being banned, former advisor to the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, Sergei Kuzan, tells The Telegraph. He notes that all these processes make democratic methods of changing power in the Kremlin impossible. Work is already underway to prepare a possible successor who would suit all the influence groups, so even in the event of Putin's sudden death, without additional factors and changes within Russia, we should not expect a change of regime. Kuzan emphasizes that the Russian opposition does not have a strong leader and the ability to exert serious influence on changing the situation in the country, which is well understood by officials in the Kremlin. According to him, the current domestic problem for the Russian government is the activities of partisans, the recruitment of security forces by Ukraine and the activities of Russian volunteer formations fighting against the Putin regime. These are not just show trials, they bring real results, contributing both to the reduction of Russia's military potential and to the creation of preconditions for further changes in Russia itself, Kuzan says. As the former advisor to the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense notes, it is the army and other security structures of Russia that form the backbone of Putin's authoritarian regime, which is why the main intelligence directorate of Russia, GUR, is betting on such processes, having a network of agents in the Russian armed forces and other state and security structures of the system. Kuzan recalls how a career Russian officer, Daniel Alfarov, was recruited in 2023. This man convinced 11 Russian servicemen to surrender to the Ukrainian armed forces. And in August 2024, as a result of a successful operation codenamed Reeds, the headquarters of enemy officers was blown up and the executor of the operation, a Russian officer, subsequently went over to the side of Ukraine. The material says, the media also reported various acts of sabotage on Russian territory, including sabotage on the railway and the blowing up of bridges used to transport military cargo. On April the 8th, 2024, the GUR announced sabotage on board the Russian small missile ship Serpukov of Project 21631 Buyan M, as a result of which the communication and automation systems were destroyed. The ship, a carrier of the Kinzhal and Onyx cruise missiles, was at the Russian naval base in Baltisk, Kaliningrad Oblast, and according to the main intelligence directorate, could have been deployed to reinforce the Russian Black Sea Fleet. The details of the operation were kept secret for several months. The explosion on the ship was carried out by a former Russian sailor at the Baltic Fleet under the pseudonym Goga, who had access to state secrets, notes Kuzan. He believes that the facts of the presence of Russians in the Ukrainian armed forces and the recruitment of Russian servicemen by Ukrainian intelligence not only undermine the Russian propaganda thesis about Nazism in Ukraine, but also serve as an example for other Russian military personnel who do not agree with the actions of the Kremlin. At the moment, it is precisely this kind of resistance to the Kremlin that produces real, tangible results that affect Russia's military potential. It is precisely this kind of resistance that Ukraine's partners should rely on, the political figure emphasizes. Flares and explosions were seen in the border between Israel and Lebanon on Monday night into Tuesday morning. The Israeli military launched small ground raids against Hezbollah and sealed off communities along its northern border on Monday as Israeli artillery pounded southern Lebanon and signals grew that more forces could soon be sent across the border to fight the Iran-backed militants. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said Israel informed the U.S. about the raids, which he said were described as limited operations focused on Hezbollah infrastructure near the border. There were no reports of direct clashes between Israeli troops and Hezbollah militants, who last engaged in ground combat on Lebanese soil during a month-long war in 2006. Earlier, the Israeli military declared three communities along Israel's northern border to be a closed military zone, in a possible precursor to a ground invasion of Lebanon. The order restricts entry and exit from the communities to military forces only. The towns are Mechula, Misgav AM, and Kfar Jalati. 
Areas can also be declared closed military zones if an imminent threat is detected. A Western diplomat in Cairo whose country is directly involved in de-escalation efforts said an Israeli ground operation in Lebanon is imminent. The official, who spoke on condition of anonymity due to the sensitivity of the situation, said Israel had shared its plans with the US and other Western allies, and conveyed the operation will be limited. Israel and Hezbollah have exchanged fire almost every day since the war in Gaza began, displacing tens of thousands of people in Israel and Lebanon. Israel says it will continue to strike Hezbollah until it is safe for families to return to their homes near the Lebanon border. Hezbollah has promised to keep firing rockets into Israel until there is a ceasefire in Gaza. It was not clear if Israel had made a final decision on a broader ground operation in Lebanon. The Israeli army's radio station said a cabinet meeting wrapped up late Monday, with Netanyahu continuing to consult with security officials. Hezbollah vowed Monday to keep fighting even after its longtime leader Hassan Nasrallah and other top officials were recently wiped out by Israeli strikes. Over 1,000 people have been killed in Lebanon in the past two weeks, nearly a quarter of them women and children, according to the health ministry.